Recording in progress. All right. Um, so again, welcome everyone. I'm Deborah Kane. I'm the president of the Lower Columbia Canoe Club, and we are a recreational paddling club based in Portland, Oregon. And for those of you that are just joining, I was saying, um, oh my gosh, we have lots of participants on tonight's discussion, was, which is a little bit ironic because this is the one talk that I didn't really um, do much to promote uh, because when I posted this talk on Facebook, I don't know, a month ago, oh, within like a week, thousands, you know, a thousand people had expressed interest in the talk, which um, frankly was a little bit overwhelming and um, ironic because tonight of all nights, um, we're not joined by uh, Teresa Greider, who is typically my co-host for these talks that the Lower Columbia Canoe Club puts on. Teresa's recovering from um, a surgery, so I don't I don't know if she'll join us tonight. She might pop in, but she won't be leading tonight's discussion. I will, um, which is, I think, ironic and maybe good, frankly, uh, because I uh, am not the most experienced person when it comes to self-support boating. Um, I am a kayaker, a hard shell kayaker, and um, I'm a hard shell kayaker. I'm your uh, the president of the club. I'm your um, presenter for tonight, and I'm also the only person currently capable of letting people in out of the weight room. So I'm <laughs> managing a lot of tasks at the moment. But um, by way of an introduction to the discussion on self-support boating, uh, I'm a hard shell kayaker. I've probably been a boater for I don't know. 12 years, more or less. And uh, I started kayaking because my my family went on a rafting trip. Um, we as a family had a raft before I had a hard shell kayak. So, you know, my husband and I, two young kids were on a rafting trip and I was sitting on the raft and my husband was on the oars and these two young kids, I don't know, they must have been 10 or 12 at the time, you know, all they wanted was a snack or they were cold or, you know, they wanted one thing after another. And so it was my job on the raft to, you know, feed and water the children and keep them comfortable. And I watched these kayakers go by when I was on the raft taking care of my kids. And I was like, oh, I, I want to be one of those people. So I learned to kayak um, basically right after my very first rafting trip. But then it became the family habit that we would go on these, you know, these overnight multi-night uh, trips and my husband and the kids would be in the raft and I'd be in my kayak and, you know, we'd have other rafting families with us and other kayaking buddies. But what was always so great, of course, about the raft, right, was the raft carried all your gear if you were a kayaker and you could go on these big, you know, adventures and eat steak at night and you know, bring these Dutch ovens and have beautiful cobblers and all the rest of it. So for, you know, 10 out of the 12 years that uh, that we've been a boating family or that I've been a boater, I have grown to be very, very dependent on raft support. And I uh, never, you know, never really crossed my mind that I might go on a multi-night adventure without raft support until my good friend and the safety chair of the Lower Columbia Canoe Club said, you know, you should really try self-support boating and you'll love it. It's so great. Um, I was a little bit intimidated by it at first uh, and I had a lot of questions about it. So uh, I think we're going to cover a lot of those questions for folks that maybe are not as familiar with self-support boating on tonight's discussion. And um, with that introduction, I, uh, as someone who's relatively new to it, I, I think I'm still pretty uh, close to some of the questions that people might have. So hopefully we'll cover a lot of them. Um, I want to do a quick poll before we get started. So let me see if I can throw this poll up. Um, I shouted out Annika when she first joined, because I know Annika does a lot of self-support voting. I want to see... Um, how many of you who are logged into tonight's discussion already have experience with self-support boating? And then of those of you that do, I'm curious how hardcore you are. <laughs> you know, do we have any folks that have self-supported on the Grand Canyon, for example?
Can't tell. Oh, so we do have somebody. All right, two. Two of you have been on a 13 plus night trip. Three of you. By the way, if you answered no to the first question, you guys still have to select something for the second question. Oh, interesting. All right. Shoot. Thank you for letting me know. Um, well, I am with the majority of folks on that one to four nights. So, you know, I think I've been out three nights is my max so far. Um, and we're about 50-50. That's interesting on folks that um, have some self-support uh, experience and folks that don't. So for those of you uh, in that 50%, I'm going to end the poll. Um, and I'm going to rely on you, the four of you who've been on a 13 plus night trip to help me out. Um, I'm going to I'm I'm going to rely actually on the 50 currently 51 percent of you who um, say that you've got some self support voting experience to help me with tonight's presentation. So I've got a little bit of a, an agenda that I'm going to follow, but I'm also going to um, pause at a few points and you know ask for feedback from folks who have just as much experience as I do. So. Uh, watch for those moments and please be sure to be super active in the chat. So let me end the poll. Oh, share the results. Sorry, could you guys not see the results that whole time? Do you see them now? Can I get a thumbs up from Viola? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can only see so many of you. Um, all right, great. So everyone's seen the results. We've got half, so we're half and half. People who have and people who haven't. Um, I've already said this. People who have, I'm going to ask you to help me out. And people who haven't, um, feel free, not that I can look at it right now, but feel free to hop into the chat and make some notes about what you're hoping um, to learn about tonight. And then folks who have done self-support voting, because I'm here all by myself tonight, if you would help me keep an eye on the learning goals of the other folks so that we can make sure that we cover most of them. All right, I'm going to stop the sharing. Get out of that. I'm going to admit the last few people out of the waiting room and we'll keep going. All right, so the presentation that I had prepared for tonight um, I want to just cover real quickly, like, what are we even talking about? What is self-support voting? Um, why do people love it so much? You know, why would you want to do it? And then if you're going to be self-support voting, one of the biggest things you're going to need to think about is what will you take on your first trip? Um, not only what will you take, but what type of boat will you pack stuff into? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, kind of best practices and theories on weight distribution in your boat. We're going to talk about boat characteristics and modifications that you can make to your boat to make it, you know, a good, quote unquote, good self-support boat. Um, then we're going to talk like literally about what are you stuffing your stuff into, right? What are the, what are the things you're going to put your stuff into before you put those things inside your boat? Um, how will you pack those things into your boat? How are you going to even get them into your boat? Where will you put those things? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about concerns that people might have about a heavy boat. Um, that was something that I was, you know, had a lot of questions about when I first started. I was like, wait, so I'm going to pack all this stuff into my boat. And then, oh my God, my boat's going to be so heavy. How's that going to work? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to cover water and waste systems. And then we're going to talk about ways that you might test your systems. So again, I have not looked at the chat yet, but hopefully that covers a lot of the things that people were um, saying they were interested in learning. So that's where we're headed tonight. Um, what is it? What is self-support voting? So self-support voting is the opposite of what I talked about in the beginning, right? Where you go on a multi-night trip and you've got raft support. With self-support voting, you generally have everything that you need for your overnight adventure in your own boat. So you are self-sufficient and you are self-supporting yourself, right? So you're packing 
um, all your food, all your cookware, all your sleeping gear, all your clothing, you, you and only you are carrying your stuff. Um, why would anyone do self-support voting? What are some of the, um, the benefits of self-support voting? What do people love about it? And for that, I'm going to, I'm going to hop into the chat and see if some of my, the 50% of you who say that you've been self-support voting, can you just throw out some stuff that you love about it? Why would you do it? Freedom, you're fast and light. Agility, self-reliance, sense of adventure, solitude. Prepped for the worst case scenario. Tiffany, it's funny. I thought about that too. I was like, you know, the thing with self-support voting, not that you would ever want to get separated from your group, but in the off chance that you got separated from your group on a self-support trip, you theoretically should have what you need, right? Versus you get separated from, you know, the raft that's got the kitchen and all the food, and that's a bigger problem. Um, Annika, yes, less logistically challenging. How many of you have, you know, been on a raft trip and, you know, well, less logistic is challenging. And, and I also just say um, easier on the back, right? Like less stuff to lug, right? You're on a big raft support trip and it's like one, two, three, lift. You know, you're getting those big dry boxes out of the rafts. Um, you just aren't dealing with all of that stuff um, on a self-support trip. You're, you're light and you're nimble. And there might be lower barriers to entry. We'll talk about that, Katie. Yeah. Less speeders. That's true, Preston. That's a great one. I like that. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say you have to be hardcore because uh, you don't, but you have to be semi-serious. You know, you've, you've got to be relatively thoughtful about what you bring along um, when you're doing a self-support trip. Okay, perfect. Let's see what else I wrote down. Oh, the other thing I like about it is, honestly, I feel like, you know, there's just more time in camp to relax and hang out. Like there's less chores, you know, you're not making these big, huge raft supported meals. And so you're not on kitchen duty, you know, like you're pouring hot water into a bag and licking your spoon and wow, you know, you're done with your chores for the night. So I love that about it. It's simpler. Um, I don't know if anyone has said this, but also the portages are easier, you know, like if you find yourself on a river where you actually need to portage, you're not, you know, lining rafts down. Um, you're relatively, you know, nimble on portages as well. Less fuss, more nimble. Um, and the other thing, honestly, about self-support boating is you can go places that rafts can't. So, you know, it's not even about not bringing them. I mean, sometimes like they literally just can't go in some of the same same places that you can get with your kayak or your canoe or your, your pack raft if you're in something smaller. So, okay. Are folks excited? Are you wanting to do this thing called self-support boating? All these positive benefits? All right. Oops. Um, so you want to go self-support boating, which means you just signed up to carry all your own stuff. So in general, what's all your own stuff? What, what do you as an individual need on your first self-support adventure? Um, I kind of have it broken into kind of three categories in my mind. Um, you know, there's your shelter stuff, your sleeping stuff, your clothing stuff, and your personal stuff. So shelter, you're going to bring a tarp, maybe you're going to bring a tent, right? You're going to bring something to create shelter. This is all obvious stuff, but we'll just go through it. You're going to bring your stuff to sleep right? Maybe you're bringing a sleeping pad, you're bringing a, what are they called? Sleeping bags. Some people just bring like, um, you know, down comforter type things, down blankets, because because they've chosen their clothing. They're going to have lots of fleece clothing and just a down blanket. And they've decided that they know enough about the weather at this time of year, at this place that they're going, that they don't actually need a sleeping bag. So, all of these things you're thinking about, right, as you're getting ready for your trip. 
Um, and then there's kind of the personal bucket, like how much personal stuff are you going to try to bring? Because remember, you got to pack all this into your boat. So are you bringing, you know, the 600 page book or are you bringing the small magazine? You know, what are you, what are you bringing personal wise? Um, swimsuits, towels, you know. Um, are you bringing a little fanny pack because you want to go on a hike? Are you bring insect repellent, your binoculars, your sunscreen, like what's all the stuff that you're thinking about for in camp, your headlamp, your, you know, sunglasses, your brimmed hat for shade. So that's your shelter, sleeping, clothing, personal. That's all got to get into your boat somehow. And then you also need to bring your cook kit, right? How are you going to feed yourself? You got to bring all your own food. There's no, no dry box on the raft to shove your Pringles. Um, and there's also no ginormous water jugs on the raft. So you're responsible, right, for filtering and creating your own safe water, right? So what's your water filtration system going to look like? What's your water system going to be? And then your toilet kit. There's also no groover. You, you are carrying your own human waste in your boat down the river as you go. So you got to think about how that's going to happen, how that's all going to work. And then in addition, because you're out there all by yourself, you got to think about your rescue gear, which you would have on any trip, right? Um, two weeks ago, we had a conversation, the Lower Columbia Canoe Club hosted a conversation with Shannon Crosswhite on things to pack in your, in your life jacket, in your PFD. So, you know, not everything has to go inside your boat. You also can be thinking about what's going to be in your life jacket on a self-support trip with regard to rescue, first aid, repair. If you, you know, cracked the bottom of your kayak on a self-support trip, would you be able to repair it? Do you have the tools you need to repair your boat? And then in an absolute emergency, you know, what do you want to have? Do you want to have, um, you know, a sat phone? Do you want to have a GPS? Like how far back country are you going on your adventure? So these are all the things you're thinking about as you're getting ready. And, you know, all this has to go inside your boat. And, you know, people who do a lot of backpacking, right, they're, they're used to thinking about, you know, the bare essentials, like, what do I really need? So it's, it's, it's very similar with self-support boating. You got to really get down to, okay, what do I, what's absolutely essential? And, you know, what's essential for one person um, you know, it was different for another. So this is a self-support trip I did um, just last year. I think it was late August, early September on the South Fork Salmon. And it's my friend Shannon, that's her signature move with her two piece fingers. And um, Shannon's like packed and loaded and she's done and she's ready and she's stoked. She's got all her stuff in her boat. And uh, Bob, on the other hand, is not packed yet. This is photos like taken right after Shannon's picture. And he's like, oh my God, I brought too much stuff. And I, I don't know, I see like a book and Bob's still kind of wondering if it's all going to fit. So um, you, you do have to think about what is absolutely essential, right? For you to have on the trip. And um, my other friend, Tom Frisch, is on the same trip. And for him, bringing his guitar was essential. Um, none of us realized or knew that Tom had packed a guitar into his kayak, but he somehow did. And honestly, it made for a magical trip. So um, quick question for my friends who have been on some self-support trips. If you guys could hop into the chat for me, my question for you I have a few questions. You can you can answer any of them. Um, what in your mind would be the absolute worst thing to forget on a self support trip? What do you always take two of? 
Is there something so essential? Yeah, absolutely. Do not forget food. Um, and what's a crazy something? Does somebody have a friend like Tom Frisch who brought a guitar once? What's the craziest thing you've seen on some of your self-support adventures? Bring two sources of fire. Love it. Bob, who is um, in this photo, he's eating, he's got the hat on and he's eating. I was really glad on this trip that Bob brought two baseball caps because I didn't bring any and he had one for me to wear, sun protection, exactly, yeah. More lightweight than alcohol. Mm, some things, dot, dot, dot. I think I might know. Two hammocks, Molly, love it. Sat device, lighter. Camera. Cell phone battery charger, two knives. Green tea is much better than coffee. Oh, those are fighting words. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, I mean, the, the, the coffee discussion when it comes to self-support voting is, are you going to actually like, you know, how coffee snob are you? Are you going to use the little, you know, Starbucks via packets and do instant? Or are you going to actually, you know, do your pour over, boil your water, blah, blah, blah. Because when you do, now you got to think about um, those coffee grinds that you've got to get back out. Garmin and reach. You'll stop more. <laughs> um, what does that mean? Goo with cough, caffeine. Oh, oh, literally goo. I get you. All right. Um, okay. So essentials. Es what your essentials, right? Like somebody's going to be able to survive on tea and somebody's not going to be able to survive on tea. So what is essential is going to look different for everyone. Um, so you want to be putting some thought into that. And then um, once you've figured out what's essential to you, I would definitely bring my banjo, Creston, love it. Um, I'm, yeah, I would love to be on your trip. I just love music, but you know, a harmonica, you know, it's a little smaller, a little easier. All right, I'm leaving the chat. I'm going back to my presentation. Um, the kind of, I'm moving on to um, the, my next agenda item, which has to do with, the kind of boat that you're going to be doing this self-support boating in, right? So we talked about um, what is self-support boating? It's taking everything you need in your own personal craft. Why would you do it? Because it's amazing. It's freeing. It's liberating. You feel like a rock star. Um, you're not schlepping a bunch of stuff. What will you take? You will take the things that are essential to you, but also you'll take the things that are essential to the group, right? Like you're not just talking about your own stuff. You know, you're not just bringing your own stuff. You're, you're, you're bringing rescue gear. You're bringing first aid stuff. You've got to break down paddle for others. Like it's not just about you, right? You're, you're going to be thinking about things that, that are essential to a successful trip overall. Um, and then what kind of boat will be best? So Based on what your essentials were, and again, essentials are different for everybody, this is probably not the trip for your playboat. You want to take a relatively large volume boat because you're going to be needing to pack a fair bit of stuff into it, right? Um, so a big river runner or a creek boat um, you know, if you maybe, I don't know, got a boat one time and felt like it was a little too big for you. So you, you held on to it, but you never really loved it because it was kind of felt like it was a little too big. So you got this other boat for your day to day river running. Maybe that boat that felt too big that one time might be a good option for your self support running. Um, 
some people that I know, uh, I, so I'm small, I'm like five, zero, 110 pounds. So I pack everything I need into my Mokno. I have a small Mokno. Um, but I've heard from other people who day-to-day -day paddle a small Mokno, as an example, who have, you know, who bought a really well-priced medium Mokno for their self-support trips because they wanted just a little bit more volume, but they wanted a boat that felt familiar and that they understood. So, you know, on one hand, me personally, I want a boat that's, um, you know, forgiving, predictable, comfortable. Like I, I still want to feel like I'm boating well, but you need a boat that's big enough that you can get your stuff into it. Um, some people literally have a dedicated self-support boat. I don't know. Is Jenny Goldberg, is Jenny on the, I think she might be. Oh, perfect. I was just going to say, um, Bill Brock, you just mentioned it. So a lot of people love the prions, right? Um, definitely the best self-support boat ever made. And Bill, I'm guessing that the reason you love the prion and you think it's the best self-support ever made is because, is it possible that it doesn't have those internal supports? Um, good German plastic, no center pillar. Yes, exactly. Okay. So you're in this, yes, blow mold. Exactly. Perfect. Um, Walkaboats are probably the easiest to pack of the modern creakers. Annika, thank you for saying that. I've got an, a photo I'm going to pull up and we're going to look at Shannon's walkabout. Um, prions are heavy. Totally agree. Because um, they have no safety features. Preston, you're funny. Um, it's so great. I love the chat. You guys don't listen to me. Just hang out in the chat. Um, so People who've been self-support boating, they have their opinions, right? On Bill just demonstrated on which boats are the best. So in general, you want a high enough volume boat that you can get your stuff into it. And um, weight distribution is something that you need to consider when you're thinking about what boat you'll take, because you do want to put things in the bow and things in the stern, right? So you don't want to just shove three days worth of everything you'll need into your stern because then you'll be like super stern heavy, stern heavy and, you know, doing stern squirts down the river. So you want relatively equal weight distribution between your bow and your stern. And in order for that to be possible, in order for you to even get stuff into your bow, right? Think about your, your boat right now. Like what are your, your foot pads like could you sneak a sleeping bag past your foot pads in your current boat probably not so can you get your foot pads out easily and not use them on this self-support trip or do you have a super old school boat that just you know that doesn't have that center pillar so you can get stuff into the front. So um, there's, a again, you know, tons of opinions about best boat. A lot of people love old school boats like the Prions that don't have center pillars because it's easier to get stuff into the bow and also sometimes easier to get things into the stern. Um, Modifications, let's look. So at that Waka, um, Annika, this is kind of just what you said earlier in the chat. When I, so first of all, I want to say a few things about this picture. Um, so my friend's Shannon Finch, and I have no idea what trip this is. This is not the South Fork Salmon trip that we were on together. And I do want to note that I was on Facebook today and, you know, I had used this photo for the Facebook event announcement and People were like, wait, she's taking a box of wine and a glass jar of Maker's Mark. And I admit, I didn't look closely at what Shannon had laid out on her um, blanket when I used this as a <laughs> promotional photo. I, I I have no idea what trip this, this is. It could have been like a one night on a flat water adventure. I have no idea. Um, this is not, you know, you wouldn't ordinarily be taking a bottle of whiskey and a, you know, box of wine. So I'll just leave that there. But the thing that I noticed about this photo was how easily 
Shannon would be able to get stuff into the stern. So look at that huge gap between her seat and, you know, the, the kayak. You know, when I look at my Machno, for example, my, my seat is like way shoved up, you know, into the back. And so one of the things that a lot of people do, you know, depending on which kayak they're taking, um, and I'm so sorry, I should have announced at the top of the hour that this talk is going to be kayaks uh, heavy, <laughs> but um, is move their, their seat more forward or more into a, you know, true center so that there's space between the back brace and the plastic part of the kayak to shove things into the back, if that makes any sense. So you might think about moving your seat so that you can get things into the back of the boat. Um, and you might think about taking out foot braces in the front of the boat as necessary. Um, so I think some of this has been said in the chat, but I did want to pause here. Smart water bottle of whiskey. Um, 18 hours, you guys are funny. You are, you're having fun in the chat. Um, I think people have already answered this more or less in the chat about what time, what types of boats you all use. But I was curious if anyone, um, according to the Ferry Old Fasten, you don't need the rear center pillar on any boat if the stern is stuffed with gear. Curious if this is it just proven? I do not know. Curious if anybody can answer Travis's question. Um, I'm just curious if anybody had a boat with a hatch. If anybody's using a crossover boat that has the hatch. Yes, Ian, would you really do say class three plus without any foot brace? Um, yes, and I can talk to you more about that. Oh, who just did that? Is that you, Annika? Yes, Annika, brilliant. Can you unmute yourself, Annika? Uh, I'm trying. Is that, you did. You, you did it. Yep, you're perfect. Tell us what what you're showing in that photo there. Uh, I'm trying to show that uh, on my walkabout, uh, I think as somebody mentioned, some lack of safety features. They do tend to have quite a bit of space on that foot plate or bulkhead um, between the the shell of the boat and those foot plates. So I stick yeah. a lot of skinny gear in there. Yeah. And then I fill that gap with that big chunk of foam and those uh -huh. heel blocks. Um, so that allows me to put heel blocks in on there and keep all my stuff in the front of the boat um, in front of those foot plates. And then in the back there, um, I couldn't get a, I couldn't find a good picture of the uh, wakas. I think maybe the picture that you have of Shannon is probably better, but yeah actually that guy's just uh repairing his boat but you can just see the amount of space and every boat varies a bit with the amount of space between your seat and your rear deck so you might have a ton of space in the stern like the small Machno, which i also used to self-support out of which was way too small for me um but that that space in the back you can get stuff in there it's just harder to do because of the lack of space between that um your rear cockpit combing and your seat so uh just kind of trying to show the differences there and i'll see yeah. if i can find some more pictures of that perfect thank you annika so glad you're here um all right so and uh megan stomper 80 medium mamba small uh-huh Small Zen was the worst to pack and the stomper was the easiest. Okay. Yeah, I have a small Zen and I never even thought to try it. Um, and then thank you to the folks that have been telling me um, that the hatches more or less are really only for the Grand Canyon trips. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've never seen anyone. Thank you, Richard. That's exactly yeah, what I'm talking about. I've never seen anyone. Um, you know, no one on my trips has ever had a hatch and it, yeah, I always wondered how it would work. Okay. Um, why are hatches only for Grand Canyon trips, Rebecca? 
I'm assuming, I mean, Grand Canyon, you're talking 21 days. That's a lot of, a lot of food, a lot of boat, and the boats are much longer. Um, so you're going to have much more space. Okay, um, let me move on. I'm getting distracted by y'all in the chat. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the other thing to think about, oh, and then here I just want to say, um, this is Shannon's actual uh, kit for the, the trip uh, where I'm showing lots of photos from, from the South Fork salmon trip. So no big bottles of whiskey, no boxes of wine. Um, this was what was essential for that three night overnight. So what do you, so you've, 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 uh, you've figured out what's essential to you. You've spent a lot of time evaluating your boat options, either with, you know, the boats that you already have in your quiver, or you spent a lot of time on Craigslist trying to find some of these old prions or other boats that don't have, um, some of the limitations that the more modern boats have, or you've convinced Annika to let you borrow one of her Waka kayaks. Who knows? You've got your boat. Um, you've got all your stuff laid out and then you have to put it into stuff, right? So um, we're not necessarily just talking about the dry bags that you would throw all your stuff into uh, on a raft, right? Those are way bigger than what you would be able to take on a self-support kayaking trip. So um, yeah, Shannon's got them in her picture. Um, she's had them in both of her pictures. I don't even know what these are called. Somebody in the chat who knows more than I do will, right? But you've got these float bags that are actually dry bags, you know, that you can get stuff into um, that are pretty popular for self-supports, at least for getting stuff into the stern. So you're going to see these a lot. And then um, I have heard from Teresa Greider that, you know, lots and lots of little bags is a great way to go. So I probably have, I don't know, eight or nine or 10 of these um, Sea to Summit dry bags, but they're dry bags plus compression sacks and they come in multiple sizes. So I'm putting things that I really, really, really okay. want to stay dry, like my sleeping bag, for example, into a medium one of these, compressing it, and then stuffing it into a large one so that it's double double protected from water. And then Ian, to your question about removing the foot braces in the front, um, a lot of my soft goods, if you will, like my tent and my bag and some of my clothes that are going in these smaller bags are going in my bow. And my feet are actually pushing up against my gear as opposed to pushing up against, um, you know, traditional foot braces. So you're going to probably need to evaluate what types of dry bags you have to get your stuff into. Um, you also can be thinking, well, not literally everything has to go into a dry bag, right? Like tent stakes don't necessarily have to be in a dry bag. There's things that don't have to go into a dry bag. Um, and then you have a whole practice to develop around how you pack your boat. Um, by which I mean like literally do you, and there's no right way to do it, right? So the only way to know how you do it is to try, but do you take your float bag that's really a dry bag and stuff it full of all your gear and then like those yellow ones in this picture and then walk it down to your boat and shove it in to your stern because you've got one of those awesome walk boats and you figured out how to create space to shove? Or is your entrance into your stern like really tight and awkward and obnoxious? In which case, maybe you're actually shoving your empty bag into your boat and then packing as you sit on the side of your boat. Does that make sense? Right? So there's no, there's no right way to do it. Um, Jenny Goldberg, uh, I was, was on my last self-support trip and she did something 
that I thought was absolutely brilliant. It's the first time I saw it. And she basically just dragged her boat up into camp and literally stood it up against a tree and just started drop, drop, dropping things into her stern, letting gravity be her friend, right? Because all the stuff that she wanted in the very, 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 you know, back far reaches of her kayak, she could get in because the, the boat was literally, you know, straight up and down. Um, so there's lots of different ways to pack your boat. Um, there's lots of different considerations with regard to where you're gonna put certain things. Um, we talked about the fact that you wanna pack into your bow and into your stern. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is that you want what are basically your heaviest items as close to your butt as possible. So you want the heaviest items in your, you know, your whole kit to be more or less in the center of your boat. Um, your stern probably has more volume than your bow. And if that's true, then you want kind of like high density things in your bow, knowing that you're gonna put just more overall number of items into your stern, if that makes any sense. Um, and you wanna be thinking about this, this term ballasting, right? So in general, you want heavier items, you know, A, as close to your center as possible, but also in the bottom of the boat, not in the top, because the more ballasting you can do by putting heavier items on the bottom, the more stable overall your boat is gonna be. Um, just hopping into the chat. Oh, those are cool. Sorry, now I'm getting distracted. Um, the other thing to think about with regard to where, where your stuff is gonna go, um, some people put things in their lap, others do not. Um, I am a do not kind of person. I, I kind of feel like if I were to have an upside down experience or the potential of an out of boat experience, I really wouldn't want things in my lap. Um, as I was trying to get myself out of my kayak. So I don't put things in my lap. Some people do. Um, I would say that your goal is to get everything inside your boat. Um, I've seen some like, do not do this pictures of people who, you know, had that one last item, that one last, you know, bag of stuff that they just really wanted to take and they would strap it to the back on the outside of their stern. Um, I would say that's not a good practice. In general, you don't want to have things attached to the outside of your boat. Um, it's, you know, the kind of thing that could compromise your ability to roll. It could complicate, uh, you know, a potential rescue, rescue if your boat was pinned, um, and you're just more likely to lose things if you have things outside your boat instead of inside your boat. So the goal is to get everything inside your boat. Thank you, Zach. I'm not a lap bag fan either. Um, and then, oh my gosh, as if this wasn't all enough to think about, the other thing to have in the back of your mind is that where things go in your boat will potentially change as the river days go by, right? Because that bag of food that was super heavy in the beginning is gonna, you know, over time not be your heaviest item and other things will become your heaviest item as, as things in your kit get used. Or good advice that have your stuff should go at the bottom of Yes, yep, yep, yay Ian, learn something. Um, so ballasting, think about if you want things in your lap, I would say don't do it. Um, try to get everything inside your boat and recognize that as soon as you get your system down, two days later, it will need to be different. <laughs> so um, where to put things and how to get them into your boat is a consideration. Um, 
So backpackers, right, you know, backpackers worry a lot about weight, which is, you know, certainly something that is, um, you know, it's a consideration for self-support boaters. But the other thing that self-support boaters really worry about is size, you know, because there's only so much room in your boat. So, you know, how small is your puffy? How small is your, I don't know, your, your, your kitchen kit, you know, how, how small can you get things? Oh, and I don't know if someone said this, um, but the other thing to think about once, oh my gosh, you've got all this stuff into your boat, you absolutely positively should secure it inside your boat, right? So um, imagine a scenario where I've got all my Sea to Summit bags full and they're, I literally have like four individual Sea to Summit bags as an example in my bow. And they're all their own individual units. Um, but by the time it's all said and done, they also, um, they all get a cam strap looped through every single one of them. And then they, they are all like literally physically attached to the boat, right? And so then the same would be true for things that you put in. When tying items down, please use bungees as much as possible. Your hands will be so beat up with knots from camp. It's a lifesaver. Good, perfect. Thank you, Peter. Um, mistakes were made. <laughs> first and only self-support trip right right so you you went to all the trouble you figured out what your essentials were you got all these you know great bags to put things in you figured out where everything goes in your boat you're stoked you you know you shove off and oh my gosh you swim you have an out of boat experience and you didn't strap things into your boat so absolutely positively you know, your, your last step, your first step, as you're thinking about where things are going to go is also how you're going to get a cam strap or a bungee cord or who knows what through a loop on every single item in your boat so that you won't lose anything. And I know a lot of people feel like, well, you know, it's, oh my God, it's so tight. You know, I shoved it. Oh, you should have seen me trying to get that whatever, my, you know, tent stakes or my breakdown paddle into the stern, there's no way that's going to come free. And there is a way. So tie everything down, make sure it's all strapped together. So here's Bob. Remember Bob? He was like, oh no, will it fit? I don't know. Now he's happy. It all fit. Um, Bob and I and anybody else, you know, who shoved off from shore on their very first self-support trip, um, one of the most common questions, one of the most common concerns is, oh my God, am I going to be able to maneuver and navigate with this super heavy loaded boat? And I just want to say that I, it's funny, I can see myself in the background all excited, raising my hand. Um, pick me, pick me. The answer is that loaded boat will hold a line like you have never held a line before. Um, yes, it might be a little more difficult for you to set your direction. It'll just feel a little sluggish. It'll feel heavy. You're going to want to use your core more. But when you get that loaded boat on the line that you want to be on, it will go. It will charge. It will hold a line like your light boat just doesn't. Um, the other thing, the other benefit of this heavy boat that you just created is your um, gear laden boat will punch holes that you might not have otherwise thought you could punch. It will drive through holes, it's amazing. And I am here to say that your loaded boat you might find is easier to roll, believe it or not, than your unloaded boat. And that's a beautiful thing <laughs> when you realize loaded boat is a hole punching machine. Thank you, Bill. Um, loaded boat holding the line. Yes, it's so good, Ian. I mean, it's so funny because every time I do a self-support trip, I, I say to my friends, I'm just going to start putting weights in my boat when I, you know, boat on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it, it's like, it's like, 
paddling a different boat when it's loaded um for me in particular since i'm so little so um don't trust me though don't trust me on these things the best thing that you can do to get yourself ready um to do your first self support trip is um is try it is play is you know load get all your essentials out um put everything on the floor of your living room and try to pack your boat see if everything fits realize that it won't all fit figure out what you're not going to take um there's no better way to you know to figure out what's going to work for you than just trying and testing and i will tell you that you know if you are on your first self support trip and you show up at the put in and you haven't gone through the exercise of figuring out whether everything's going to fit um you know you might get some looks so 100% you know, find some time to go through the exercise of figuring out, you know, what you might take on a self-support trip. Um, and then do a test trip on what I would call familiar water, right? Like um, your very first self-support trip should not be the, I'm going to step it up on a run I've never done before that I'm a little bit anxious about you know, et cetera, et cetera. Your very first self-support trip should be like, oh, you know, for example, I've been down the rogue five times, raft support. I feel pretty confident on the rogue. I know the lines, I know the rapids. Um, I feel good on it. Yeah, I'm gonna try the rogue. Or uh, what would be another really great self-support, first self-support in Oregon would be the Grand Ronde. Um, you know, relatively straightforward run, beautiful river, you know, three nights of kind of getting your, your, your systems in order. Um, so I think I'm, oh no, I still have to talk to you about, um, the Deschutes is a great self-support river. Perfect. Yeah. That sounds like another good one. Um, so test your systems by doing a test run um believe me when i say a heavy boat is a beautiful boat and then the last thing that i wanted to talk about really quickly uh was just water systems and waste management because i feel like you know uh how do i say this you know when you're going out on raft supported trips you know of course you're bringing your clothes and of course you're bringing you know your sleeping bag or the stuff you're going to sleep in and you know you're bringing a tent whatever like some of the some of the mechanics of it right are are super familiar um the thing for me that was most different about self support trips was you know a the fact that my boat was so heavy and i was carrying everything and then b the fact that you know there was no big um community water jug that I was just getting my water from every day um, and that there was no groover. So for sure, you want to put some thought into your water systems. And I was honestly surprised when I asked that question about, um, you know, what do you, what do some people take two of, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, they always have two or three different ways to make sure that they're, you know, always going to have clean water. So, you know, it's everything from, I have like the, you know, the UVC stick that you can just um, use to make sure that things are killed in your water. Other people are going to bring like a gravity feed filter. Other people are going to make sure that they can boil water. Um, I've broken a water filter pump. Yeah, so definitely. It's the kind, so, so water systems is the kind of thing you want to have redundancy in. You can also just pack iodine tablets, you know, as an absolute last resort. Um, and then I, Lauren just said the exact thing I said. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and then the other thing that you really want to think about is human waste, right? So you're, there will be no groover. Um, a lot of people just use wag bags, but right. When you start off your trip, your wag bags are, you know, clean and empty and dry and they're in a certain kind of bag, but as the trip goes on and you're creating waste, you, you literally need and want an entire containment system for your waste because you don't want that in with all the other stuff, right? So you, you're going to think about how you're going to transport your waste out. Other people use, right, like the PVC pipes. 
Um, so all the things, you know, all the tricks and things that you've done um, on backpacking trips is the same kind of stuff you're going to be thinking about on your first self-support trip. Um, sorry, I'm just call it the poo one. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, interesting. For cleaning wounds, we were recently, recently taught clean water, but no iodine. Um, good tip. Thank you, Tiffany. So, um, oh, and honestly, you know, the other thing to be thinking about, it's so obvious, but just make sure it's, it's on your list. You know, if you're making a packing list, it's hand wash stations, not, not a station per se, but right. Like when you're on a big rafting trip there, you know, the, there's the pump and all the, you know, the lovely communal hand washing stations. And you want to make sure that you have a way to sanitize and, and wash up on your own self-support trips. Um, all right. I think that is it for me by and large. The things that I didn't cover, um, collapsible shovel trowel, um, the things that I didn't cover are many. Um, you kind of don't know what you don't know until you try it, uh, which is one more reason to, you know, to Try your first self-support trip on a relatively low consequence excursion so that, you know, if you forgot something or, um, you know, didn't quite get a system right, you weren't, you know, either too far from home or out for too long or facing the biggest rapid of your life the next day. That's not the kind of, you know, situation you want to put yourself in. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that, uh, you know, everything I learned about self-support boating and practically everything I've learned about boating in general, I learned from Teresa Greider and Teresa Greider, the LCCC safety chair, she actually wrote a, a series, a three-part series on self-support boating for American Whitewater um, several years ago now. And it's a fantastic series. Um, we basically covered content from Teresa's first two articles, you know, boat selection, gear, things to think about. But um, the third article in the series that Teresa wrote is just on, um, you know, safety considerations more broadly about river selection, cruise selection, um, you know, uh, wilderness first responders, CPR trainings, like things that you might want to make sure that at least somebody in your crew, um, you know, is comfortable in emergency situations, that kind of thing. So all of that is covered in Teresa's third article. Um, and what I thought I would do is we always, you know, record these talks. This, tonight's talk is no exception. And so when I circulate the recording for tonight's talk, I'm also going to circulate or distribute links to Teresa's three articles on self-support voting. They're fantastic. I highly recommend them. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention is, and forgive me, I'm, I'm talking to you guys and not online, um, is, I'm going to stop share real quick, is um, we planned a, a day to practice. I forget when it is, but the if you check the calendar, uh, the Lower Columbia Canoe Club's website, we set aside a weekend. It's coming up. I think it's in April um, where we'll do a one night overnight on the Sandy River. That's where we're thinking. Um, we're thinking we'll do April 15th. Thank you, Leanne. Um, we're going to do Dodge to Oxbow. So we'll spend a lot of time at Dodge, you know, we'll like, you know, eat lunch, do your thing, have a good meal, have your last good meal, <laughs> um, eat lunch at Dodge, and then we'll spend the afternoon just packing boats. And there'll be a bunch of us walking around and helping and, you know, talking to you about where you're putting various things and you know, weight distribution, all the stuff that we covered tonight will be there to help as, as folks are packing boats for the first time. And then we'll shove off from Dodge. And there are actually a few places that one could camp. Um, so we're not going to run all the way down to Oxbow on that Saturday. We'll, we'll stop, you know, halfway and we'll literally camp out and you'll have a chance to figure out whether all your clothes are soaking wet <laughs> or, you know, how your tent situation works, or whether you forgot the, you know, stakes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and then, you know, it'll just be fun and we'll talk about what we learned. And then you'll get to have the little experience of, you know, packing everything back into your boat the next morning. And then we'll paddle out and we'll end the day at um, Oxbow. So that's coming up. And if you are a member of, I thought it might be a mystery ship or a book. book. Um, so if you're a member of the Lower Columbia Canoe Club, you'll see that uh, on the club's calendar and there'll be a note about it that'll go out, you know, two weeks before to, you know, to sign up if you're interested. So that concludes my formal presentation. I thought there was no camping on the Sandy River. I believe there is. And um, we've checked with a few folks who've, who've told us that we can. Um, Annika or others, um, were there things in the chat early on that folks had wanted to cover that we failed to cover? Or if you have a question that didn't get covered, North Fork Lewis. Oh, that's a good one. Also works for a one night trip. Thank you, Ed. Okay, I'll check that out. I'm Am gonna, I, yeah, go ahead, Annika. Okay. No, go um, ahead. Just a, another note on the groovers. Um, yeah. So I've found um, on a lot of rivers, you don't, you're not required to take a hard-sided container. Um, and so a lot of times on just overnight trips, we'll do straight wag bags inside of a designated dry bag, obviously labeled as something different than your other ones that you'll never use for anything else. Um, but what I like to do is kind of a happy medium between saving weight and uh, keeping that secure and waterproof is um, depending on the night or the number of nights I'll do a, like a, a peanut butter jar container um, with just dog poop bags which um, there's there's some technique involved in uh, <laughs> aiming for a smaller area but uh, they do take up far 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 less space than your wag bag with the poo powder inside that you buy and they're obviously cheaper and if you have a dog you probably already have some anyway um, and then using that and then uh, some poo powder sprinkled in or uh, powdered bleach works really well uh, to keep the smell down as well as um, if you're on a really long trip that's hot like the Grand Canyon you're going to get gases inside there after however many days, as well as pressure changes in the atmosphere and elevation. So uh, I think powdered bleach is a really nice thing to add to that. Um, uh, and then, yeah, peanut butter jars or uh, right now I'm looking at a, a jar of Costco chocolate covered caramels on my countertop and it is a uh, perfect size for maybe like a five night trip or so so just look around your house and see what you have and it's probably going to be lighter and cheaper and just as waterproof as like a homemade pvc pipe for the poop solution but it does require that you use smaller wags than the wag bags that you would buy at rei annika you're in good company i know a lot of uh, uh, folks that are in the peanut butter jar club. So. <laughs> and you made me uh, go look for my my bag. I'm sure, I don't know if anybody can read it, but it's labeled self-support specialness. This is my designated bag for my specialness. Um, and Teresa's always laughing at me because she thinks it's a really small bag. And I'm like, well, mind your own business. It's my bag. Um, so P in your water bin, homemade book. Any other thoughts or questions or comments, things that we did not cover? Just scrolling really quickly to make sure we got everybody. Preston, do you want to defend the lap bag? You totally can. Uh, mine says shit kit. Uh, <laughs> on uh, I'll defend the lap bag. I mean, yeah, go for watch, it. If you watch like Middle Kings or Stakeen videos, basically every like, internationally renowned world-class class five paddler has either a watershed Ocoee or a watershed Chattooga on their lap. And 
If your concern is safety, I can tell you that one, if you don't attach it to the boat, if you really want to get out of your boat, you're going to get out of your boat. Um, and then, you know, if you don't have anything with you, but you can grab your bag and hold on to it and float. Um, Aniel, uh, Sarah Solsace, he, he used his uh, watershed Chatuga bag to run several miles of the Stikine when he got separated from Benny Marr when they were doing uh, trying to do two speed laps in a day. So, yeah. you know, having having that option to have something with you, if you can grab it, is is a lot safer than um, whatever you think your foot entrapment hazard is. And and yeah. I wish I had a picture of it. I probably do on a GoPro somewhere. But what I do is you usually I paddle dagger boats and like where the pillar meets the track at the front of the track, there's a little gap under there and you can take like a like the type of sling you would find on uh, an alpine quick draw, like a mm -hmm. two or three or four four foot Dyneema uh, sling, and if you kind of just do a you know a little hitch there, you can get it pretty tight. Put a locking carabiner on it. Uh, you know the watershed bag is made so that if you cinch it down correctly, there's really no loops for your hand or your feet to get caught in. And there's also a little clip on the front of it. Um, so if you clip it there, I mean, obviously I'm out of my boat more, more times than I'd like to admit with my bag clip, clipped like that and mm. with it not clipped and I've always gotten it back and it's fine. So, yeah. um, you know, if, if you think it's uncomfortable, uh, it's also more comfortable if you put some air in it because it's not going to move around. Right. Um, so. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's been proven by all the best paddlers in the world that they, they basically use that on every run they're going on. A lot of times it's to take their photography gear because they're influencers or whatever. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, yes, you could think it's like an entrapment hazard, of course. Um, and it, it probably violates the clean line principle or whatever, but um, there's a lot of people doing it and yeah, if you don't have to get into the back of your boat or the front of your boat to get your snacks or or your sunscreen or or whatever, like you're less of a pain in the ass to everyone else on the river, and um, you'll get used to it. Yeah, it's so funny that you that you use that example because I, you know, I too actually read an article today from um, how do you say his name, Annual Sir Annual. It's a crazy story. He like ran the stikine with his watershed bag. He like I, swam and swam and lost his boat and like blew air into it. And then I was totally, just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I gonna totally, be stuck out. Stuck out. I here read that article. And, uh, yeah, down the river. <laughs> I did. I read that article today, and I I even think I read you know like NRS or I don't know who you know interviewed him and you know what's your top five tips for self support boating, and um and he doesn't pack anything in his bow is what he said, is that, you know, it's just in his lap and in his stern. So, you know, there's, there's no right way to do it. There's just, you know, a few principles that a majority of people are following. And, um, and you know, just the whole, the whole question about getting stuff. Uh, you know, one thing I didn't talk about is, is exactly that, right? Like, you're trying to be super nimble. You're trying to be super compact. You're trying to get all your stuff into your boat, but at the same time, you know, you also perhaps want easy access to things, and that is exactly why a lot of people end up with stuff in their lap, and or you know, one of their one of their bags in their bow that they can get to easily. So you know, you're thinking about that every morning, right? Like, what do I what do we want to have access to? And it's a balance between, you know, what do I want to have access to that's, you know, in my boat versus what do I want to have access to that's, you know, on my person in my life jacket or, you know, shoved down the leg of my dry suit, depending on what season you're in, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the only way is to dead. figure out what works for you is just to get out there and do it. The weight of that bag is dead center. And, and yeah. honestly, the, the only time it bothers me is like if I'm in a light boat on like a playful river or something where you know even a pound pound or two extra you can feel that in the balance of your boat but yeah if there's other weight in your boat like you're you're not going to notice it at all yeah you're gonna, be, you're gonna be glad you have it it makes sense all right good defense
Good defense offered by Preston. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I think that we have more or less covered the questions. I'm just doing a quick scroll. Lap bags for life. <laughs> um, please do this Zoom meeting more often. This one on self-support voting or just Zoom meetings in general? If you mean Zoom meetings in general, we do Zoom meetings all the time, Peter. We are going to have another one um, two weeks from now. What is, oh my gosh. And two weeks from now, we're going to have like the absolute best canoeists in the United States on a panel for of the, like the, you know, uh, Nolan Whitesell and all of his colleagues and peers will be on a canoe panel um, two weeks from tonight. And then four weeks from tonight, we're having a discussion about boating in Costa Rica, um, which would be, you know, whether you're interested in boating in Costa Rica or just boating internationally, it'll be a good talk for you because we'll talk a lot about things to think about um, when you're evaluating options for international kayaking or boating. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We'll hopefully see you on another LCCC talk. Um, and if you signed up for the talk, yes, I saw someone was actually asking about the articles. If um, if you registered for the talk, that means we have your email address, which means um, we'll send you an email with the links to the three articles on self-support voting. So everybody will get those from me probably tomorrow, um, if not the next day. So have a great evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. And thank you for those of you who helped me, by the way, Annika and others. Um, I really appreciate all your insights. And of course, join us on the practice. Um, it'll be fun. And we might change rivers. I'm kind of, I'm intrigued by that North Fork Lewis suggestion. So I'll check that out. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Do you have